It's kind of with a little bit of trepidation that I come here to talk to you because I'm going to be telling some things that aren't necessarily the story you're used to. And you might, and some of them might be a little bit challenging even. But this is what I believe is true and what, as a scientist, I believe is best, represent, best represents the available evidence we have today. Um, and Bat Tasmania and Western Tasmania is a hugely important place for me not just because of the way I love the place, but also because it's biologically it's really important. Um, can I do this slide second? First one. Okay, so let's talk about Gondwana. The story about Gondwana is, is you can see also we think one. about this, glibly think about Gondwana as being a, a place where we can sort of like know it and understand it. It's sort of a simple story. But it was huge. It's gigantic. Just think about this. There's Australia up there. Australia, of course, is 3,000 kilometres wide. From there to there, maybe about 12,000 kilometres across Gondwana. And it goes from the South Pole to the equator. So straight away we have this idea that there's this hugely diverse place with a hugely diverse landscape. And therefore you'd expect a real diversity of different types of things living there, just because different, place, different organisms live in different kinds of places. Uh, so hugely just because different, place, different organisms live in different kinds of places. Uh, so hugely diverse, so there you go. Uh, so we have mountains, we have the sea level, we have the middle of a huge continent sitting somewhere near the South Pole and reaching all the way to the equator. So there'll be a huge diversity of things there. Another thought. Um, it also lasted for a hugely long time. So it's not a snapshot truck. It's Godwana, actually, people tell to say that Godwana started about 550 million years ago. But the mm -hmm. Godwana that we would think about is really when it became an isolated continent, supercontinent from the Northern Hemisphere, um, Laurasian supercontinent. That happened a bit over 180 million years ago. And some of the signs of it are happening. We have here dolerite and the Permian mudstone, and that's actually that interrelation is actually about the the early stages of Gondwana as we would think about it. But then the last split, the very, very last split between Antarctica and South America was 30 million years ago. So we've got about 150 million years at la last looks like. If you think about 150 million years, let's just scale that down to 150,000 years. What's happened in 150,000 years? Well, look at Tasmania, it actually started 150,000 years that looked like that, middle of an ice age, went to an interglacial, lush interglacial, where, where the climate was actually a bit warmer than it is now. Even with global warming, it was still a little bit warmer. We're getting there. Then back to an ice age, then back to something like this, then back to an ice age, and then up to the environments of the last 10,000 years. So in 150,000 years, You've got from Ice Age to conditions like now, to Ice Age to conditions like now, to Ice Age, back to conditions like we have now in 50 million years. So, when we talk about Gondwana, we're talking about many, many things. More things than we can imagine. Certainly more things that we have evidence for. We just have this little skim of evidence. So it varied hugely from place to place. It must have. Even without evidence, we just have to say it must have varied. It varied from time to time, over 150 million years. So we're talking about a complex story. And I'm going to try to drill down onto some of the interesting bits of it and relevant to us. Carry on. So to do that, we need to know about the evidence. So how do we know about what there is? So what we can have is is we can have fossils, so these are some belief fossils, that's a little fossil conifer. Yes, um, this is a fossil of a, an extinct seed fern, a charistosperm, which is actually from Western Tasmania, and is the last record of these kinds of things in the world. This is about 51 million years old. And 
So that's one kind of fossil. You can also have fossils of pollen grains or spores. And these things tell you different things. These kinds of things, the bigger things, are quite rare. But they're very good because they tell you quite a lot of detail. The fossil pollen grains are hugely abundant. I've, I've got a terrible joke that I tell my students, and I'm, I might be banned for life over that. <laughs> what is it? It's one of my fossil, favourite fossil sites is a place called Stony Creek Basin in Victoria. Um, what it is, is it's, it's actually the Dalesford Speedway these days. <laughs> because it's beautifully flat. And it's beautifully flat because it's on the top of an old lake. A lake that stopped existing quite a long time ago. And that lake formed when a volcano erupted about 1.75 million years ago. And it filled up with sediments over about 300,000 years. Layer after layer after layer. And the sediment in this stuff is, I've been in there with a, an excavator and down the hole with these <coughs> quivering walls of bl black, brown, blancmange stuff, seeping water. I, I, we would never be allowed to do that <laughs> under workplace health and safety. <laughs> and it's black, brown, black, because it's full of organic material, particularly fossil pollen grains. In fact, one cubic centimetre of those, that stuff will have about 200,000 pollen grains. The basin's 200 and something metres wide, it's 69 metres deep, it's all like that. That means that there's about 10, no, 100,000 million million pollen grains there. And if you line them up end to end, <laughs> if you line them up to end to end, you'll actually end up about two thirds of the way to Uranus. <laughs> True. The, the numbers actually do work out correct that way. <laughs> and so there's huge numbers of them, but the problem is that they don't tell you to a great resolution. So this is the fossil pollen grain that you get from Myrtle, the phase cutting home, and what it'll uh, but you can't tell the difference between it and its New Zealand relatives or its South American relatives. Um, next thing, and the last other way we can look at it is we can look at the relationships among species. So this is just a an evolutionary tree with some times on it for the conifers of the world. And you can, that can tell you some things about relationships. So for instance, we would look at the pine AC and we'd see that they're at least this old here, and they're a northern hemisphere group, and so maybe that says that in the northern hemisphere these things were tracking back that far and further. Uh, next slide, please. So given that kind of evidence, let's just think about well, what's happened, what, what we would get. So at the beginning of Gondwana, we know, we know a bit about it. So 180 million years ago, Tasmania is fabulous because it's got a wonderful fossil site that, that tells you about that time. It's the Loon River site. So there's a couple of people having a little think about it. Um, <laughs> Ross Jones so some, is one of the people there that someone might, people might know. And that's one of the things they love getting out of it, which is fossil fern. But really, the plants and stuff, this is what was really there. So this is a nice little bit of silicified conifer wood. Um, people will tell you that it's agathus cowrie. Not strictly true. It's actually something which has wood that looks like cowrie. We don't know exactly what it is. All we do know is that they're dirty big trees. And they were the dominant trees in the forest. And what else was there? A whole bunch of ferns and a whole bunch of extinct stuff. And that's pretty much what we know about what was happening in those forests of, in the early Gondwana. We come on a bit a little bit more recent, we start getting better evidence. So we go to about 70 million years ago into the late Cretaceous, so just 5 million years before the dinosaurs went extinct. What's kind of interesting about this is what we find in the fossil record there challenges quite a few of our more modern preconceptions about what Gondwana is about. It says, not rainforest. What it says is open heathland country with fire. And so we have living relatives of, this is, this is Conosperma proteaceae, a lovely thing from the east coast, but also mostly Western Australia and a bit into the east. Uh, Banksias were there, um, Epacrids were there, so the heathland kinds of, of species. 
So a little bit of a different view there. So instead of it's just being rainforest end to end, no, not really. And fire was certainly a big part of that system. And click one more, please. And of course, eucalypts were, were just appearing about that time, and eucalypts are very definitely Gondwanan. There are beautiful fossils from South America now, which are a bit younger, they're about 52 million years old. And of course, a bunch of the things we have now, like this is the beautiful creeping pine, which was, even though it's just a little thing we see in the Alpine Tasmania, creeping across rocky things, it was world dominator. It was everywhere in the Southern Hemisphere and one of the most common things. And we don't know whether it, what its habit was. Was it a big tree or was it like this? Maybe a bit of both. And so, in that time, at least part of Gondwana, some of the bits we know about, were probably more like this than the rainforest. So if we skip a bit further on, so obviously I've um, just leaped oh, a trivial 20 million years, <laughs> during which several things happened. At least several. <laughs> In fact, quite a lot more than a several things. <laughs> 50 million years ago, this is where the Gondwana story that you're most familiar with really comes from. The whole Gondwana story about rainforest comes pretty much from this time, more or less. This is the peak time of the warmest and wettest period of the last 70 or 80 million years, the early years. So our climates were warm and wet. In Tasmania, we have evidence from the west coast, from Strawn, where it's actually as warm as the tropics now. So lowland tropics, like Cairns. And what else we had? Uh, there was lots of rainforest, and that's where a lot of the story comes from. And that rainforest was not so much the rainforest that we see now in Tasmania. It was actually really diverse. And it had a lot of stuff that we now think of as tropical things and a lot of stuff that we can't quite work out what they are. And a lot of conifers. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. But there were also, through that time, the non-rainforest was there. Because remember, Gondwana is such a huge place. There's space and time for everything. And so there was probably stuff like this, so alpine stuff, and of course, this of course is part of Tasmania, which has <coughs> the fabulous relict alpine vegetation, which I'll come to later. Or indeed like this, so open things full of these ancient things. Next. So that's Mount Reed. But what about this? This is the stuff that we know and love. So this is a, a beautiful, very beautiful myrtle forest, the Caledendrous Rainforest. This is actually from the northeast, but you could, could have taken this photo in the northwest. Could easily be the Tarkine. <coughs> um, this is actually a bit of a challenge. This stuff, even though the species in this kind of vegetation were present, oh, the ancestors of them were present in Gondwana, none of the actual species were, the ancestors were, in fact, every bit of evidence that I know of says that this kind of vegetation only appeared after Gondwana broke up. Um, my second shard tell is the story of Gondwana comes, and Nothophagus comes from this kind of fossils, these kinds of rocks here, where you probably can't see, let's put a paddock here. You might be able to see black things in old. If you come up and look at them, you'll see that that's actually beautiful fossil leaves, and they're obviously like Nothophagus leaves, and certainly like the ones in northern New South Wales or in South America. Absolutely. This stuff first appears after the break of Gondwana, about 30, in Tas Tasmania, about 33 million years ago, and then just got bigger and bigger. So, in other words, this is actually a recent artefact. A recent, not a fact, a recent um, appearance of creation. It's really quite surprising. So the myrtle fossil pollen type was actually really rare until about 30 million years ago, and then it went straight off and became really, really abundant. So well, it's this sort of stuff, it's a, it's a slightly different way of viewing this. So what I've done is I've kind of bagged out the, the, you know, the, the classic Gondwana and Tasmanian rainforest story that as we see we go to the Tarkine, Gondwana, not really. 
But there is something special about Tasmania. We all know there is. <laughs> we do. And um, this is the science. You could say science warning. Just that word. How do you ever do it? Um, what I, that's a word that I use, a word that a lot of people use. But what's nice about it is that it captures in one word a whole heap of the stuff that is really important and unique and special. Paleo and Derek. Paleo means old, you know about old. Um, well, I certainly do. Uh, <laughs> endemic means, you know, lives in one place and not in other places. What paleo endemic really means is that things that are old and there's not much of them. So if they're old and there's heaps of them, maybe we don't care so much about them because they're not a problem. And if they're young, you know, young's okay, but, but there's a lot of young stuff. But things that are old and really uncommon are quite special, and Tasmania is one of the world's most important places for that. Okay, some of the things we might already have in your head is the conifers. So people have talked a lot about King Billy and Pencil Pine, and yes, indeed, it's absolutely a fabulous patio and Debbie. Together they are. So as a group, 150 million years old, and of course, just only in Western Tasmania. Creeping pine actually outdoes King Billy. It's just as old, and it's actually quite a bit less distributed because it's just in the Alpine area. Um, this is one you may not know as well, some of you would. It's, it's Mount Mawson pine, Ferrosfera hookeriana. Same again, but even a little bit more so. And then we have a bunch of others, so Hewan Pine certainly gets a Guernsey, but not at the, quite at the same level as them. Um, that's Diselma, the Cheshunt Pine, and, and Celery Top Pine also gets a Guernsey. But it's not just them, it's not just about the conifers, even though they are kind of the showpiece. There's a whole heap of flowering plants, so the woody plants. Oh, have I been a bit fraudulent? I'm only talking about plants. There's a heap of interesting stuff about animals as well. <laughs> but I'm not an expert in that. So, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> woody flowering plants. The showpiece there is quite possibly this little baby, which is Tetracarpia tasmanica. Doesn't really have a common name. It's another alpine plant, subalpine plant. See it at Mount Field. See it quite a lot in, sort of like in the southwest. You can actually see it. Sort of in moderately low altitude in the southwest. It's a whole family of plants on its own. Um, our Proteaceae, so Belladina, the mountain rocket, it's the showpiece, but other things like the lovely, delicious, stinky Port Arthur plum, Centurinus nitra, nitra, and what's sometimes called the white waratah, Agastacus. Again, really good paleo endemics and more. And some of the heaths, so like climbing heath. Sometimes rainforest, but it's also well and truly out in the alpine plants. Um, and some other ones. So this is Dracophyllum milliganii. Last one. And yes, finally, finally I get to know the phagus. <laughs> but only the phagus. Not really myrtle. Myrtle's just, well, myrtle's is just a bit vulgar. A bit young and vulgar. <laughs> a bit common. <laughs> But yes, it does, but it only just creeps in with the vagus. It's not really up with these other things. And there are some other things that, things that we have no fossil record and no chance of getting a fossil record of. So like some of the, the monocots, so this is Campanema lineari, which is almost a family on its own in the lilies. <coughs> this is the Huardia, Isophysis tasmanica, which is a member of the iris family. And you think about irises, they're all over the northern hemisphere, they're in Africa. This is the oldest bit, one. We got number one. And um, Christmas bells is with its two sister species of the family on its own, and there's others. So here's where the story kind of gets interesting. Um, where are they? So here we are. If we actually take these paleo endemics and say where they are, here they are. Here they are. So like the red spots are the paleoendemic spots, and there are places that you'd, you'd recognise. So that, I think, is Mount... Wait a second. No, I think that's Mount Anne. I think that's part of the Western Arthurs. Um, 
Mount Field isn't a big spot, but it's a really important one. Actually, no, that's Mount Field, sorry, that must be Mount Anne there. Um, Cradle Mountain's up there, that's Rocky Hill, which not many people have been to. And in fact, what you can do is you can actually work out, say, predict where they should occur by where they are, should occur, but to do that, that tells you what are the characteristics of where they live are. And the key thing is that they're really intensely focused to small areas. They're really small areas. Next slide, please. Now, where do they occur? They occur in the really wet and cool places, just really on the tree line is the focus of these things. Um, so one of the most important places is actually the beginning of Tarn Shelf. Another one is the top of Mount Reed on the other west coast. Um, and this picture is just a little bit of sciencey stuff. This describes the climate, so this is how warm the climate is. This is how wet, wet it is, so up there is really wet. That means up the top one means that it basically never dries out. And what you can see is here, these are the paleodendics. They're tucked incredibly densely right up in that top corner. Cool, super, super wet. And most species in Tasmania cluster way down here. They're all over the place, but mostly down here. So it's this cool, wet, open and undisturbed landscapes. So the places we find these things, so what they are, so this is what we're very excited, important and thinking about now is particularly in the idea of climate change where we're losing the, um, these cool, wet areas and particularly since these things hate fire and fire is a big component of... Fire is what's hitting us right now through climate change. It's the biggest impact we've got right now. In the future, there might be other ones, but it's the one we're really going to worry about. That's all I wanted to talk about. Thank you.
when, when we're thinking about the different programs for the Wild Mind series, um, it's interesting because we started off with a fairly narrow focus and then without too much time or effort, it came quite quickly down to um, issues which are under, underpinned by climate change. And this issue certainly, as Greg's alluded to, fire, which uh, is an imminent and dire and uh, threat, and it's a threat that has occurred twice through anthropogenic climate change 2016, 2019, and the fires on the Central Plateau. But before we get to that, I'll just run through the slides now. The first shot we just had a second ago, uh, the West Coast Range, again, autumn snowfall covering Vegas, uh, pencil pines. Um, moving down altitude a bit, this is west of Cradle again, we've got a pretty good complement of uh, ancient paleo-endemic. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call them APs for short. Um, Fagus, celery top pine, pandanis, pencil pines and myrtle. Same bit more pandanis, just keep rolling through them. We all know that pair. I mean, they're gorgeous things. This particular shot was taken, I was camped for four or five days on Cathedral Mountain, and it was just pouring, it was blasting. And then it stopped, so I was in my tent for three or four days, almost without stop. And it stopped raining for about 10 minutes, I dashed out, and all of the um, ground was totally flooded. And this little pool had formed at the base of this Vegas, which had dropped its leaves. Um, and so I you know, grabbed the shot, went back, and stayed in the tent for another day. <laughs> And then when it stopped raining the next day, I went out and the pool had gone. So it was one of these gorgeous ephemeral things that happen, you know, just in, in passing. The shapes of our, you know, you know the phagus um, or any of the highland species, are, you know, they're gorgeous. They're shaped through time. So they embody antiquity. Um, they're shaped through extreme environments, ice, wind. Um, they end up being very lovely things. of our planes. This was a bitterly cold day on the near Mount Ironstone on the central plateau, this, this you know, frigid southerly coming through, not with snow, but just steady, quite strong wind and really, really cold temperature and just light dusting of, of snow, which was sticking on everything because it was about minus 10 in the wind, very cold. And the place most of us would know and love, you know, the, the hot spot for pencil pines in Tassie, the walls of Jerusalem National Park. And then going to the rainforests, we won't say more about the fact, the, apart from the fact that they are rainforests here in the Tarkine. Lovely, you know, ancient myrtles, tall trees, groves of leatherwood. Headwaters of the South Esk. Just pause there for a second. So this takes us to the northeast of the state, and we've had a, sort of a nice little tour through the nice parts of um, the vegetation, and now I'll just briefly diverge into the uh, the human threats. This is a place called Tombstone Creek. It's in the headwaters of the South Esk River. It no longer exists. It was a place I stumbled upon uh, in. 2003 or 2004 and went back several times and took photographs. In 2006 it was logged, uh, clearfield and burnt. What was characteristic about this place is it had immense sassafras, like they were just giant sassafras, um, you know, scattered through the forest. And it was essentially a rainforest with, you know, tall yuke emergence. It was logged and then burnt down to mineral earth. And that, then that's the shot taken 10 years after it was logged. We had a session at the uni today and one of the things I was talking about was um, carbon emissions from, from logging. And this exempl exemplifies it really in that you've got intact forests, you know, with carbon body or carbon sequestered in the soil and obviously in the above ground vegetation. And yes, it will come back as is shown here, but we're looking in terms of centuries rather than, you know, what's required because we're obviously in a very critical juncture and it's five to 10 years we're looking at now, not, you know, a couple of centuries. So there is, thanks to the rainforest uh, uh, special, special species management plan, which was gazetted in November in 2017, it opened up 
um, much of Tasmanian rainforest, which is not in national parks and world heritage areas, to logging. And so just scroll through these ones, starting from Bruni Island there. Uh, little slivers of rainforest on the east coast. This is a place called Big Sassy Gully, and then up to the northeast, Mount Victoria, um, and also Mount Victoria, in same area. And just a bit west of there, gorgeous place called the um, Paradise Plains. The Rattler Range, which is an amazing open high, just hold it there for a second, a high ridge which cops uh, moist, warm air coming in on northeasterlies. And so it's our closest thing to cloud forest because it, it's probably, probably actually its rainfall is not, you know, particularly high, but it just is very often in cloud, moist air coming straight up off the ocean to a fairly high mountain range, eight, nine hundred metres, uh, which runs you know, directly across the line of the prevailing nor'east, moist nor'easters, nor'easterlies. And it's, the northeast is like this shot as well. It's characterised by um, gorgeous calodendrous rainforest, open, um, beautiful walking. You can walk in any direction and just delightful. Calodendrous means cathedral-like, and so that's, you know, it is, it's cathedral-like. Mount Victoria again. For some reason, characteristically at Mount Victoria, um, there's a number of large myrtles, which are multi-coppiced. I presume it's fire, like maybe 400 years ago, there was a fire which didn't kill them, but they all coppice, and then they've been fire-free since that time. Greg can shoot me down later if that's wrong, but that's, you know, how it would present. Going across to Vale of Belvoir, uh, Vale of Belvoir conservation area. You know, so all of these places are zoned for, or available for rainforest logging. The plan stipulates a 300 year rotation, but logging 90% of the rainforest in conservation areas and regional reserves in that time. And realistically, in, in the face of cli changing climate, um, the impacts of logging, roading, opening up, uh, des uh, you know, fragmentation, desiccation, edge effects and so on. Um, if that were ever to come to pass, we would lose the bulk of that rainforest, there's no question of that, and we'd certainly lose all of the rainforest wilderness, including, uh, I think we've arrived now at the Tarkon, Australia's largest rainforest wilderness. Um, only 5% of this is, of the forest area, is reserved in Savage River National Park. The rest is uh, either future potential production forest or regional reserve. There's a number of regional reserves. You know, the Tarkine is an extraordinary place. As I said, it's Australia's largest rainforest wilderness. And currently its default is not only open to logging throughout, um, but also open to mining. So obviously this is not a state of play that, we'll, that we will allow to continue or to be implemented and acted on, but that is where we are right now. So I've got a few more here just of Tarkine rainforest areas. It's not as big as Gondwana was, but it's pretty big still. And it's diverse from you know, relatively low altitude to you know, subalpine. Um, and each of the areas within so each of the areas within the Tarkine, as in any other place in Tassie, you walk into it and it's got a different character, like it's through you know, different soils, altitude, aspect, wind, his, fire history, etc. etc. All of these places, like in one sense, you know, the large rainforest area in the Tarkine is uniform, like it's all, you know, cool, temperate rainforest. But all of the zones within that, and then obviously then down to the micro zones, they all have their own unique character. This is further south again, it's the headwaters of the Little Henty. This is a future potential production forest area. It's uh, an intact catchment. So that moves us from human impacts, which we'll leave behind now, and look at the more serious one, because all of those human impacts do pale into insignificance against the threat of fire. As Greg alluded to, in 2016, there, was fire, there were fires on the central plateau, all started by uh, dry lightning strikes. Prior to the year 2000, dry lightning strikes were virtually unheard of in Tassie. Um, you go camping in, in, in Western Tasmania and you get you know, bombed by a front and there'd be lightning and thunder all around you, but then it would pour. Um, and it's as if it switched changed in the year 2000, because all of a sudden we've got, first of all, just a couple of them, now just exponentially increasing 
over the last three or four years, dry lightning strikes, storms, fronts coming through without, uh, without being accompanied by rain. And these are devastating, particularly when coupled with um, dry seasons in 2016. It was a record dry spring in early summer in Western Tasmania. And then we had this lightning strikes and we got you know, devastating fires. So I've got a number of shots from the, the fires around that. These are all you know, pencil pines, 1,000, up to potentially 2,000 years old. Um, it not only burns and kills the pines, because they're susceptible to all but the very lightest of fires, but it burns the soil. It's an organic soil. Um, and that takes away the capacity for any regeneration you know, in many areas um, after the fire from the seed, because of the, the organic soil, which holds the moisture, which um, provides the stability, obviously, for the plants, is, has been taken away. The fire in 2016 was locally very severe, and so it's had its impacts locally, but also, you know, in a sense, even more problematic was that it was just upwind from that walls of Jerusalem, the main part of the walls of Jerusalem National Park. And all it needed was, you know, a hot and oily day, it would have been in there. So we're living on a knife edge now with the climate as it's changed and these, this incidence of dry lightning strikes. And um, that's where we are. And I think, I guess the intention, my intention in, in setting this topic was that these are our treasures, like the, the pencil pines, the king billies, the, you know, the rainforest, the um, celery top pines, all the creeping pines and so on, the human pines. These are the tre are treasures of Tasmania. And probably everyone in this room is you know, acquainted with them and loves them. But they're not widely known. Most people, like government people and most bureaucrats now, would not be aware of how extraordinary these things are. The fact that they, you know, with the exception of Fasassi and Myrtle, which occur in Victoria, um, you know, they're endemic to Tassie. They're only found here. And they are the canaries in the climate change coal mine. And they'll be the first to go, and they'll be the most devastating things to go, because they are what make Tasmania so special. Like, if I think of what, you know, I hold dear in Tasmania, straight to places, you know, you know King Billy's pencils, um, and the associated flora, that's what is really unique about Tassie, and it could disappear overnight, and it has to some degree, and it would create barely a, a murmur in the collective consciousness, the collective mind. And that's a tragedy. And I think what, what our duty is, is to raise the profile of these things so that they get a lot more attention than, than have, they have had to, you know, to date. And more resources are allocated to them. Let's just keep going through and we'll come to resources. This is more in Devil's, Devil's Gullet. It was a horrendous fire ripped up from near Lake Rowallan. Again, lightning strikes. This is the 2016 fires. Burning you know, sassy and myrtles and potentially pines on steep south-facing cliffs, you know, under, under Myrtle Gullah. This is a 2019 fires, and just pause on this one. This is Mount Bobs. This Mount Bobs is the stronghold for Kingbilly Pines in Tasmania. The biggest population of Kingbilly Pines is just over the ridge there, and it continued, and it's also, you know, scattered pines across that green slope there. Pines, the fire hit in 2019, January, did burn into the pines. There were pines that would have been burnt in that fire, but you know, it stopped at that point just before the main area of the pines. But that was fortuitous. No human resources were put to stop that fire because it was deemed, the fire was also burning west of Jeeveston, it was deemed that that was the priority and the resources that were available were not sufficient to have had an impact on this fire. So it was fortuitous. It was a gamble made that, you know, the weather was cool enough, the humidity was high enough, the winds were light enough that it wouldn't, take off up that slope. It had a good run at it. Um, and, you know, the gamble paid off. But what a gamble. Like, these are, this is a place that hasn't burnt since the last ice age. Trees 1,500 and more years old. And it was just a gamble because we didn't have the resources to actually hammer it, you know, early on in the piece. To me, this is an utterly intolerable situation. And, again, it's up to all of us in this room and beyond to clamour for these places to get the recognition and the resources that they deserve. So to end on a more, well, it's a positive and negative note, this is Mount Murchison on the west coast and the fire here would have been lit by people uh, as 95% of fires were before the year uh, 2000 or so. 
Um, it's an interesting place because to the north you've got high cliffs, to the west you've got a high ridge which wasn't burnt and, you know, with rainforest on it. Um, to the south you've got more high ridges and more rainforests and just to the southeast there's, a little area, there's an area of more flammable vegetation that's where the fire must have come. So this would have burnt in the 50s, 1950s. And it would have been an utter tragedy because you can, as you can see this is a, you know, a verdant in terms of you know, as a home for King Billy's, this would have been an incredible location. It's sheltered. It's you know, obviously right at the, the right moisture level and altitude and so on. But they're all killed. Like, there's a couple of little fagus bushes you can see. There's a couple there. And I've sort of walked crisscross this area, and there's a couple of, like, literally, you know, two or three little pencil, uh, King Billy pines about that big in one, one spot. But essentially, the whole valley, you know, 500 metres across and, you know, a K and more, wide, which would have been this fantastic King Billy Forest, rivaling Dixon's Kingdom as, you know, parallel for pencil pines, um, all lost, totally lost. Interestingly, in, across the ridge to the right, there's a, a sub, you know, a, another valley which was partially burned, um, but, but primarily not, and there's been prolific seeding and regeneration, like with these young King Billy pines, just lusty things, you know, growing like crazy. So it's obviously fantastic, it's an optimum environment for the King Billy pines. And in a sense, like this tragedy that happened, you know, 70 years ago, we can contemplate this or other places like this as a site where we could attempt revegetation, re reintroducing you know, the flora, putting, you know, hand planting thousands of King Billy pines and then the associated flora to, to try and replicate what it was. So this has happened um, to a small degree. Dave Bowman's got a team at UTAS that are doing this on the plateau um, and they've just started doing some plantings uh, in the areas of the 2016 fires. Um, that's a pilot program, we'll see how it goes. But a place like this, which has got higher rainfall, no rabbits, no deer, um, more protected from fire and probably not as cold, you know, if the pilot program works, you know, it could be considered you know, as a target site there. And not only might you get you know, the re-establishment of something resembling what it used to be, but it also in this time of you know, climate crisis, you know, climate crisis and um, you know, a very bleak future for the planet unless we pull our fingers out. Um, you know, it's, it's a symbol that, yes, we're going to make the effort, we're going to try and re rewild or revegetate these places which have been lost in the past. So I've just got a short film to finish up with.